so much, Craig and our team. What a great morning to just worship Christ with you in song. If you are new, my name is Ricky Powell, and I am the lead pastor here at Fort Caroline, and we are so thrilled that we can connect with you this morning and worship with you today. And as Craig mentioned, uh, we are in the series called Peace, Love, and Happiness. And today I want to talk to you about a message I'm calling Help Yourself to Happiness. And uh, before I launch into the message, though, I want to thank everyone who served so faithfully here at Fort Caroline Baptist Church, not only on Sunday mornings, but all throughout the week. We could not do what we do in touching lives and changing lives through the gospel of Jesus without each one of you. So thank you for your faithfulness in giving, your faithfulness in serving, your faithfulness in inviting other people to connect with Fort Caroline Baptist Church. And one of the things that I've discovered is people who serve the most seem to be the happiest people around. Whenever you learn to give of yourself, you find a key to happiness. In fact, there's an ancient Chinese proverb that reads, if you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. If you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. And I think that's true. If you want happiness for a lifetime, learn how to leverage your life for the benefit of someone else's life. It was St. Francis of Assisi who said, for it is in giving that we receive. It was Winston Churchill who said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And of course, that great theologian Goldie Hawn said, Giving back is as good for you as it is for those you are helping because giving gives you purpose. When you have a purpose-driven life, you are a happier person. And that, of course, is what Jesus said when Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to leverage your life for the benefit of someone else's life than to just live a self-centered life where all you focus on is getting. The bottom line is simply this, you will find happiness in helping others. And that's what we want to talk about today, how that you'll find happiness in helping others. In fact, our whole church is centered around this this conviction that we have as we study the life of Jesus, that happiness is found in helping others. If you've ever wondered what the mission statement of our church is, it's very simple. As a church, we exist to glorify God by helping people love God, love others, and serve the world. That's why we are here. And and we believe in the great commission of Jesus to go into all the world and to show the world how we love God, how we love others, and how we are here to serve the world by giving our lives for the cause of Jesus Christ in the world. And here at Fort Caroline, God's given us a very clear vision for what he wants to see accomplished in us and through us over these next few years. The vision is that we're going to be one church, passionately united and focused on reaching the spiritually lost through the gospel of Jesus Christ right here in our own community. We believe that God has placed us in this community not just to help ourselves, but to help people around us come to know the love of God through faith in Jesus Christ and to meet practical needs of people right here in our community. And the number one need of people in this community is a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We have a very simple strategy that we use to accomplish the mission and vision God's given us. Here in our staff, we call it the four G's. Uh, We we just name each one with the letter G so it helps us remember what we're here for. We we are here to to gather, to give, to grow, and to go. Uh, We gather for worship in person and we gather for worship as we encourage people to connect online if they're not able to be here in person. 
Because we believe gathering together on a regular basis to focus on God and worship Him and express our love to Him is an absolute vital part of our Christian faith. But not only are we here to gather to worship, we're here to give of ourselves. We, we give of ourselves financially to support the work that Christ is doing in this community. We're feeding the hungry and we're helping homeless and we're rescuing women from human trafficking and we're helping families as they raise their children. We're ministering to widows as they grieve and as they navigate a new chapter of their lives. We're helping people as they overcome hurts and habits and hangups through Celebrate Recovery and we're helping families through Faithful and True, which rescues people and helps people through sexual addiction freedom. And so there's so much that we do where we give of ourselves financially, but we also give of ourselves in our time. That we roll up our sleeves and we say, where can I help? Where can I contribute? What can I do to meet another person's need for the cause of Christ? And I'm so thankful for the few hundred people that volunteer through the life of our church. So we gather, we give, but we also grow. We want to grow in our walk with God, and we do that with other Christians. We get together in life groups, and we grow in our faith, and we grow in our understanding of God's Word. And we go. We go like Jesus commanded us to do, to go into this world and to live as missionaries, telling the next person the good news of Jesus that has changed our lives so he can change their life as well. And we go not only in our community, we go all over the world through our mission endeavors. And we believe that the church is a group of baptized believers in Jesus, devoting themselves to a cause greater than themselves. That's who we are as followers of Jesus. We're a group of baptized believers in Jesus who devote themselves to a cause greater than themselves. It's not about me. It's not about my preferences. It's not about the way we used to do things. It is about a cause that is greater than me. It's greater than any one of us. It is the cause of Jesus Christ who came into this world to save sinners and to change lives. And we are so thrilled that he lets us be a part of that. And all of this is not new for us, and this is not something that we made up and we decided is something that we ought to be a part of. No, this is the revelation of God through his scriptures. And so today I want to take you to a a passage that powerfully illustrates this truth we're talking about today, how that you'll find happiness in helping others, and that you will find purpose in your life the purpose that God has for your life when you learn to help others. So I'm going to take you to the New Testament book of Acts, A-C-T-S, Acts chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7. Here, if you're new to the Bible, the book of Acts is really the early history of the Christian church after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and after he went back into heaven physically alive from the grave. If you've ever wondered what happened after Jesus went back to heaven, what did the early church do? How did they function? What did they experience? Well, then the book of Acts is your book. It's a history book of the early church. And it shows how Jesus' mission continued through the people of God in the first century. And we can learn some lessons today as we read Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, because what they experienced And the focus of their church ought to be what we experience. And it ought to be the focus of our church. Now, while you're turning to Acts 6 or you're turning on your Bible to Acts chapter 6, let me remind you that they didn't have many of the things in the first century that we have in the 21st century in America. They didn't have political power. They didn't get to vote on who was Caesar and who was emperor of Rome. They didn't have cultural power. They were a minority and they were despised because of their morals. And they were despised because of their biblical convictions. They were despised because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And they didn't have popularity. To be a Christian in the first century meant you put your life on the line. Not metaphorically. You literally put your life on the line and you risked losing everything Because Christianity was so despised by the Roman government in in the first century if you were a Jew by your fellow Jews. But what they didn't have was just terribly insignificant compared to what they 
did have. Do you know what they did have? They had an unshakable conviction that Jesus Christ walked out of a grave alive. They had watched him die just a few weeks earlier. And then they had watched him walk out of that grave and walk into their room behind closed doors and physically appear to them alive. It shook them to their core. It changed them forever. And they spent the rest of their lives telling as many people as they could about Jesus Christ. And we find them here in Acts chapter 6 already experiencing persecution from the outside. But now they're feeling some pressure from the inside. Listen to this, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The church is growing exponentially. In fact, I was reading last night, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. 3,000 people accept Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost when Peter finishes his sermon. 3,000 people are baptized into the church of Jesus Christ on that one day. Then in chapter 2, verse 47, it says, God was adding to the church day by day those who were being saved. Then in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, it says, the number of the men, just the men, reached over 5,000 people. So think about this, from a little band of 12 to 120 to 500 to 3,000, 5,000 now. And then it says in chapter 5, verse 14, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. So now we've gone from just thousands to multitudes And then chapter 6, verse 1, it says they were multiplying greatly. Chapter 9, verse 31, it says the church multiplied. I mean, thousands upon thousands of people are coming into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the city of Jerusalem. It is an explosion of growth. And as a result of that, we sometimes read the New Testament and we think those first churches had it so good and everything was perfect and it was paradise on earth and there was just sweet harmony and everybody got along and everybody loved each other. But that's not true. They were real human beings just like us. They were a real church in the city of Jerusalem just like our church is real in the city of Jacksonville. And just like there are times people have difference of opinions or people feel neglected or left out or kicked to the curb. There were people in the first century church of Jerusalem who were complaining. They were complaining. It says there was a complaint by the Hellenist against the Hebrews. Now remember, everybody in the first church in the first century in the city of Jerusalem are Jewish. They're Jewish who've now accepted Jesus as Messiah. And so you've got on one hand the Hellenist Jews. These were Jews who were Greek in their culture and Greek in their language. More than likely, they did not grow up in Jerusalem. They grew up in other areas around the Roman Empire. But it was very typical for older Jewish people, no matter where they lived in the Roman Empire, in their later years to move to Jerusalem to live out their remaining years in the holy city. Of course, we know many people came from all over the Roman Empire on the day of Pentecost and were there worshiping God whenever they heard the gospel of Jesus and they got saved. And rather than going home, they decided to stay in the city of Jerusalem and become a part of the church. So you've got this culturally different group of people coming into the church. They don't speak our language. They don't have the same customs They drink unsweet tea when all of us down here drink sweet tea like God intended. I mean, they looked on these, the Hebrews who were born and raised in Jerusalem and Israel who spoke Hebrew and Aramaic fluently, who had very strict traditions about living the Jewish life. They looked on these Hellenist Jews with disdain. And that same idea of animosity and division crept into the church. And particularly the complaint was, we feel like that the Hebrew widows are getting better attention than the Hellenist widows because they're looked down on. 
There was no social security in the Roman Empire. You were on your own if you're hurting. And because you're now a Christian, you're in a very small group and a despised group. If you were a widow, you were very vulnerable. If you didn't have a family to care for you, you were in trouble. And that's where the church of the Lord Jesus Christ stepped up and they started a food distribution ministry, Meals on Wheels, maybe. And they take food and they give it to the widows to make sure those widows do not starve. And the church became their family. And yet some of the Hellenist, the Greek-speaking and Greek-cultured Jewish Christians were saying, we're being neglected here. We're being neglected and you're giving favoritism to the Hebrews, to your own group, to the majority group, and you're, you're neglecting us. Listen, I've been a pastor for most of my life since I was 19 years old, and I have seen people in churches argue about all kinds of things. I've seen churches split and divide over all sorts of issues, sometimes legitimate issues, and sometimes just pure selfishness. I know of a church firsthand that split right down the middle, lost half of their membership after one bad business meeting because when they redecorated the church sanctuary, they decided that the piano shouldn't be on this side, it ought to be on that side, and whoever decided that didn't get the church to vote on it, and the church argued and split over which side of the sanctuary the piano should be on. Now, some people look at Acts chapter 6 and say, I wonder if this was really happening. Were they really intentionally neglecting these widows in the food distribution? Or is this just sour grapes, no pun intended? It doesn't matter because to the, to the Hellenist, they felt neglected. They felt like their widows were not being treated the same. And there was a problem in the church. And so the first solution that maybe somebody in the church thought of is, well, the pastor needs to do something about this. The apostles need to get busy and they need to go visit more widows and take food to those widows. But here's how the apostles handled it. Verse 2, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, so they called the church meeting, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Verse 3, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, in other words, a good reputation, full of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and of wisdom, and we, whom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. The apostles call a church meeting together and say, we've heard the complaint, we know there's a need and we know that perhaps the first thought is, is that we, the 12 apostles, ought to just take on more ministry. We ought to make more visits. We ought to uh, add to our ministry list feeding widows. And this is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with feeding widows. But this is not the smart way to handle this. It's not right that we would neglect prayer and the preaching and teaching of the Word to wait on tables. There are other people who can wait on tables, but there aren't other people who can spend time with God in prayer and who have been called by God to preach and to teach His Word to all the people of God. And I know that sometimes in a growing church like ours, the pressure becomes the pastor needs to do more. Well, he didn't visit me in the hospital. He didn't send me a card on my birthday. He didn't come by my home when we moved in our new home. The pastor didn't do this and didn't do that. And the, the, the pressure becomes the more the needs, the more the pastor needs to fill those needs. And you can't do that. Number one, you're going to burn out the pastors on your staff because there are always more needs than there are staff to meet those needs. I can promise you that. But you're also going to steal the blessing of God from other people whom God wants to use in His work to bless other people. According to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and following, my job as your pastor is to get you to do your job as a church member. My job is to equip the saints, that's you, if you're a Christian, you're a saint or you ain't. 
you're a Christian, you're a child of God, you've been set apart by God. My job, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That doesn't mean that it's beneath a pastor to wait on tables and to visit widows. If anybody in our church knows me long enough, they know I do a lot to show personal care because my heart is as your pastor. I love my church family. And when you rejoice, I rejoice. When you weep, I weep. And I make hospital visits and I go to nursing homes and I do counseling and I do weddings. Last year I did 23 funerals. I'm out there ministering to people, but every night I put my head on the pillow, there are people I did not minister to. And one of the biggest struggles as your pastor I've had to overcome is feeling guilty that I couldn't do everything in one day that needed to be done. And I had to get over feeling guilty when people get mad because the pastor didn't do something. And it's interesting to me, people will leave our church and they'll go to a mega church in our town somewhere and they won't ever know that pastor. That pastor won't show up at your hospital. That pastor won't do your funeral. It's just very interesting to me. But often we think the solution is we need to get the few to do more. And the disciples said, the apostles said, no, no, that's not the solution. The solution is in the congregation. You need to choose out from among you seven men of, of good reputation who are filled with the Spirit of God. In other words, they lean on God's power to accomplish a task. And they're full of wisdom. They know how to handle things. They know how to do things properly. And you need to put them over this ministry. It's a vital ministry. But when they do their job, it frees us up to do our job, to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. And verse 5 says, And what they said pleased the whole gathering. You might want to underline that. It's one of the rare times in a church where everybody's happy. What they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. By the way, Stephen will soon become the first Christian martyr in Christian history. He will die for his faith in Jesus. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Verse 6, they set, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. Verse 7, and I love this, and the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Do you hear that? When the church came together in unity and said it's all of our job to do what God is calling us to do as a body of believers. It's our job to devote ourselves to a cause greater than ourselves. It's our job to figure out where we can contribute. It's our job to show Christian maturity that says church is no longer about what I get out of it. It's what I can give through it to other people. When the church came together like that, the word of God continued to increase. In other words, the preaching and teaching and gossiping of the good news of Jesus spread to even greater parts of the city and the nation and the world. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. It's now not just multiplying, now it's multiplying greatly. The church is experiencing unprecedented growth. Even to the point where a great many of the priests who just a few months earlier had conspired to have Jesus crucified have now repented of their sin and they've come to place their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. People you would never have thought would have come to faith in Jesus are getting saved, getting baptized, devoting themselves to the cause of Jesus they once opposed. Man, God is doing some great things. Let me give you three observations from this passage. The first is there are no menial, insignificant jobs in service through the church. There are no menial, insignificant jobs of service through the church. Acts chapter 6 is not teaching that the apostles through the preaching and praying did the meaningful work while the people who visited widows did the menial task. 
No, the point of Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, is that there are no menial tasks in the cause of Christ. Everybody pulling together, doing their part, is how God intends His community of believers to work. And the result is, with everybody working together, everybody shared in the great blessing and outpouring of God. When more people came to faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, they all could say, look what God has done through our church, through our ministry. We all have a part to play in that. If you're helping around here and you're on the parking team, you are not just parking cars. You are changing lives. If you're serving in our nursery, you're not just changing diapers. You're changing lives. If you put money in the offering plate, you're not just giving money. You are changing lives. If you serve on the lawn care team, which we need more people, by the way, serving on the lawn care team, you're not just trimming hedges or edging sidewalks, you're changing lives. If you serve on the board of trustees or the finance team or the personnel team, or if you serve as a deacon or you're a life group leader, or if you make hospital visits or if you send a card to a widow or someone sick, if you take food to someone's home after they've lost a loved one, you're not just doing a job, you're changing lives by the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, why is that true? It's because we're all in this together. We're all links in a chain. One may teach in the nursery. One may work in the parking lot. One may lead in the music on Sunday mornings. One may preach. One may teach preschoolers or work with teenagers. One may be helping with our nursing home ministry or helping visit people in their time of need, but we're all links in the chain of what Jesus Christ is doing in changing lives. I asked people on Facebook, how how has God used Fort Caroline to impact your life? And I said, I'm not looking for personal compliments, and I'm not really even looking for compliments for our church. I'm just trying to illustrate how that God uses a church to change lives. Several people responded, and then some texted me privately, and they said, listen, Fort Caroline Baptist Church was there when we lost our child. We were not Christians, and we were not members of your church, but when your church found out, you came to our home, you brought food, and you provided a funeral service at no charge. Someone else said, Fort Caroline Baptist Church has shown me unconditional love. Someone said, Fort Caroline has been with us through all the surgeries, In all the the health problems we've had, you've brought food, you've sat with us, you've prayed with us. A widow said, I've got a group of ladies and we pray with one another and we're there for each other. Someone else said, you helped us dedicate ourselves as parents to God and you helped us dedicate our children to God so that we can raise them to know Jesus. A senior adult said, you surrounded me with love when my adult son died. Another senior adult said, someone checked on me every week during this pandemic from our church. A young parent said, Fort Caroline Baptist Church has partnered with me to give me a community for my children and my family. A family that we would not have had otherwise. Another man reached out to me and he said, Fort Caroline Baptist Church is not my church. I'm not even a Christian, but through Celebrate Recovery, you guys are helping me. A few weeks ago, I conducted a funeral of someone I'd never met, didn't know them, but we were called by a funeral home and they said, do you mind helping this family? And I said, no, we'll do it. Whatever they need, you tell us when, you tell us where, we'll take care of doing the funeral. The family wanted to know, how much do you charge? We don't charge. This is why we're here. At the graveside, two of those family members' friends came running up to me with tears streaming down their faces. And they said, we rode in the car together with that daughter whose dad was killed in this accident and with her husband. And all the way from your church out to Yulee, to the funeral, to the graveside, they said, this church has changed our minds. We thought all Christians and churches were just a bunch of hypocrites. And all they cared about was your money. We've never felt so loved. Now, guess what? And I don't know if you guys are watching this online, but if you are, it was our honor to serve you and your family. 
This is just who we are. We're not perfect. And it's not just the guy that stands on the stage under the lights for 30 minutes. Okay, 45 minutes on a Sunday morning. It's, it's a whole group of people under the lights and behind the scenes, in the building, outside the building, who are working together for the cause of Jesus Christ. And there's no menial task in God's kingdom. We're all being used of God to help reach the next person. And that's the second thing I want you to hear your pastor. The second observation, we serve people among us while still being focused on the person who is yet to be one of us. Too often churches become inwardly focused and all the conversations in the church is about me and my and our and what I want and what I think and what I'm looking for and what I expect and what I used to experience and we forget all the while there is another person outside the the walls of our church, who is yet to receive Jesus as their Savior. And we are here, yes, to serve each other, to love each other, to minister to one another, but we must never forget about the next person who needs Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. We will serve people among us while still focusing on the person who is yet to become one of us. That's why we said our church is going to be passionately united and focused on reaching the spiritually lost. You say, why don't we get passionately focused about reaching each other and helping each other and ministering to each other? Because that's not the problem in most churches. The problem in most churches is we have forgotten the mission of Jesus to go and tell the world the good news of Jesus. And then thirdly, the church is God's plan A. And there is no plan B or C or D. The church is God's plan A with the gospel of Jesus for this world. If we forget our mission in this community and in this world to reach one more person with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we have become nothing more than a country club for Christians. And personally, I'm not interested In the years I've got left in my life, I am not interested in serving as the manager of a Christian country club trying to keep the members happy. I'm not interested. I am not interested in being the entertainment director on a cruise ship trying to keep the passengers happy. I am, however, willing to devote my life to reaching one more person with the good news of Jesus Christ. Because there's coming a day when the day of grace will be over and we will not have the opportunity to tell another person about Jesus. And I don't want to be found negligent as your pastor in forgetting that he left us here to take the gospel to the world. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he said, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's why he left us here. And our health as a church and our mutual ministry to each other is only, only to buttress our mission of telling the next person about Jesus. In fact, if you love this church and this church has been good to you, it is only because the people who came before you prayed for you, sacrificed for you, gave, built buildings, sent out missionaries so that you could have the church you have today. Who is depending on you now to be thinking about them, the one we've yet to reach? Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. I'm going to encourage you, if, if you're serving, keep serving. And I want to say thank you. If you're giving, thank you. We could not do what we do without you. But I'm going to challenge others of you, maybe for the first time, or maybe, maybe it's time after a season of break, it's time to get back in the game. It's time to volunteer. I'm going to send you to our church website today as your homework, fcbc.life. And our, our, our website is, is based on cards. You can click on a card. Maybe the card says prayer. Maybe the card says giving, or the card says sermons. There's also a card or a drop-down menu that says volunteer. 
I'm going to send you to that volunteer form, and I want you to express interest in serving somewhere. doesn't mean you're going to, but it just says, hey, I'm interested. Can I learn more about this? And one of us on our staff will contact you and give you all the information you need about serving. Some of you, you you've been deacons before. It's time to serve as a deacon again. For some of you, you need to serve in our preschool department or our children's ministry or our student ministry. For some, man, you're good at greeting people. We need you on our guest services team. For some of you, maybe it's that lawn care team. Or you look at it and you say, Ricky, there are all kinds of options, but what I'm really thinking about is not on here. That's why we put a box called Other. Isn't that nice of us? other. You can click that box and then type in what you're interested in and we'll contact you. Some of you may be interested in serving on the safety team of our church. We don't just let anybody serve on the safety team. I'm sure you understand why, but that's a great vital ministry that we need more help in. Maybe you're willing to say, I've got a musical ability. I want to be able to use my talent in serving uh, with uh, the music ministry of our church. We have an audition process that you can go through. Maybe you want to work in the back. Displaying the music and the words and the sermon notes on the screen or helping with the video ministry and the live stream ministry. I don't know where God's gifted you or where God's called you, but we need you. And maybe your ministry is to say, Pastor, I'll make some hospital visits for you. Pastor, I'll send cards to those nursing homes because the hardest part of my life this year has been not being able to go to those nursing homes or stand by a hospital bed with our church members whenever they're hurting. But I've discovered this, I can send a card and I can make a phone call. You could do the same thing. I thought it was God's sense of humor in April of last year. I'm laying in the OR waiting, little holding area, getting ready for my surgery. And I thought it was so humorous. Since I was 17 years old, I have made thousands of hospital visits been in that same little holding room praying for some of you while you were waiting for your surgery and I couldn't have a single visitor. (laughs) I thought, God, you've got a sense of humor. But it made me appreciate how much that means to someone if they're there for you just to show up and say, I'm just here to pray for you or to sit with their family in the waiting room while they're in surgery. Maybe you need to help us with that ministry. I'm going to send you to fcbc.life, click on that card or drop down menu and find the volunteer section and tell us where you want to serve and become a part of what God is doing in this church to reach people, to change people's lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the ability to worship you and to praise you. But we also thank you for this call, this call to serve as a part of the body of Christ. Because happiness comes when we help others. And Father, I know that right now in this room, there are people that could testify, yes, I agree with that. I have found so much joy and so much peace and so much contentment and so much happiness in my life by getting my eyes off myself and helping other people. And Father, they would say yes to this message. And I pray that because of that, others will say yes to this invitation to serve, to volunteer, to contribute, to get involved, to recognize that church is more than about what you get out of it. It's what you can give through the body of Christ to help another person. And God, we pray that all of it will be a way to help us more clearly, more passionately, more practically share the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ so that more people will come to faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. God, I thank you that the answer to the problems of our nation and our world is right here in this church. Through the people of God devoting themselves to Jesus and a cause greater than themselves, the gospel. Help us to be found faithful to share it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you guys. God bless you. Thank you for being in God's house today.